But Judith's greatest impact on science fiction is her influence on other writers as a critic and as an editor of anthologies. Perhaps her most important anthology is England Swings. This collection of experimental British science fiction had as big an impact on North American science fiction as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones had on North American music. In England Swings, Judith introduced North America to the new wave, a whole slew of angry, outrageous, controversial, dangerous British writers. In all of these collections, Judith is credited as an editor, but a better term might be anthologizer. Although I wasn't aware of it the first few years I was doing it, I began to realize afterwards that in a way, for me, putting together an anthology was writing a book. I was using other people's material. It was more like a montage than like uh, simply a selection of these are, are very good stories or the very good stories that I happen to be able to get. Uh, I would go out and fight tooth and nail for certain stories because they said what I thought needed to be said. Hey, that's what I'm doing. I'm an anthologizer like Judith Merrill. Where's that letter? Forget this endless one-sided criticism. A man's got to do what a man's got to do. And so do I. And so does Judith. She's still editing anthologies. When Press Porsapique wanted to do an anthology of Canadian science fiction and fantasy, they called Judith. The material was there. The people at Press Porsapique suspected it. I felt sure, sure of it. Uh, but it needed a name. You know, the, the golden phrase, a name. It needed a name to get people to look at it and say, oh, yeah, there it is. So um, I go around being a name. And being a resident of Canada. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, in 1968, Judith was passing through Toronto, and she decided to stay. I had reached a point where I was not <clears throat> willing to be an American any longer. Um, it was during the Vietnam War, but it was not only the Vietnam War. I had been um, alienated increasingly for 30 years or so uh, by what I perceived of what the goals and means of the country of which I was a citizen were. Oh, uh, hang on, it continues on this tape here. I went to the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968. My daughter and some of her friends were working for McCarthy and asked me if I would drive them out, and I said, yes, I think maybe in Chicago I will be able to make a decision about what I'm doing. So we went, and I did. The, I didn't know I had, was starting to make the decision when, at the end, in disgust and horror, I said, uh, what do you say we cross the border at Detroit and drive home via Toronto? And uh, it was the year that Rochdale was starting. And suddenly there was a place to go where not only was I not simply escaping to the, the sort of never-never land that England was at the time, but this was where the guys who had to leave the country were going. Rochdale was a University of Toronto residence that was turned into an experimental free university by the students. Very 60s, very open. Judith moved into Rochdale with her huge collection of books. Well, I came with this whole science fiction collection, which I really didn't know why I brought with me, except that it had happened over the years while I was doing all these things. And it was sort of like if you have a 16-year-old dog and you're changing countries, what do you do? You either have to have the dog put away or you have to take it with you because it's too old to, to change homes. And uh, I brought the books with me. And then we ran out of education money there, and there was no one to take care of the library. So a lot of the books I just left there, but the science fiction books I pulled out when I left the building. And then Harry Campbell, who was then the chief librarian in Toronto, uh, and who had been very helpful and interested when we started the library in, in Rochdale, came around to see me and said, I hear you're trying to sell your collection. And I said, yeah, you know a buyer? He said, no, but you could give them to us. And if you give them to us, we will start a special science fiction and fantasy branch. And then you will still have access to all the books, but we'll take care of them. Right. So that's what happened. The Spaced Out Library opens in 1970 and goes on to become one of the largest collections of science fiction and fantasy in the world. And on January 1st, 1991, the name officially changes to the Merrill Collection of Science Fiction, Speculation, and Fantasy.
I did eventually decide after seeing the other names they had up for sale that it would be better to let them use mine, which is what they're gonna do. Um, but in the course of, of my agonized self-appraisal in changing my mind, what I realized was that I am uh, almost more of an icon than a human being at this point. <laughs> And so all my responses to, to uh, what I want to do or, or what I might do or what I think of myself, uh, I, I keep remembering that well, all I really am is a symbol up on the arch over the door. <laughs> Judith Merrill is not an icon. She's a force. She champions science fiction as literature. She encourages and promotes writers in the best possible way by publishing them so their voices are heard. I'm losing this channel. They're trying to cut me off. Listen, I know you want to hear from comic book creators and science fiction writers, but they'd be the first to tell you that what's important is the art, not the artist. And it is art. Judith Merrill knows that. Mobius knows that. I know that. Now you know that. Tell three friends. I mean, I, I'm sorry for yelling at you, Mr. I'm sick of the Commander Rick character. What? <laughs> Next week on Second Nature, the defense of North America. Our atomic bombs are too terrible to ever use, and our conventional weapons are too terrible to ever work. Also, what exactly is Haggis?